Hi, this is Benoit, your host of the Solar Maverick Podcast. I would like to thank Schward Consulting for sponsoring this episode. Schward Consulting is a leading solar consulting firm dedicated to design, engineering, and owner's representation in all areas of solar photovoltaics for the commercial, industrial, and utility markets. Thank you again for sponsoring the podcast. Community Solar as well provides like real estate owners an opportunity to make certain income from land or even the rooftop that they're not using currently. Hi, this is Benoit, your host of the Solar Maverick podcast. I was on a great panel discussion called Impact of Renewable Energy on the Future of Real Estate at the Deloitte Renewable Energy Seminar in Dallas, Texas in November of 2019. The other speakers were Lisa Brown from Johnson Controls, Susan Nicky from Hannon Armstrong, and Todd Sampson from Deloitte & Touche, who is the moderator. I would like to thank Deloitte & Touche and Marlene Matika, who's the U.S. Global Renewable Energy Energy leader for Deloitte for having me be part of the panel and also providing this recording. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Solar Maverick podcast. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Todd Sampson, a partner with Deloitte Tax, to the stage. Thank you. Hi everyone, I was half hoping, I was trying to get the technicians to let me walk into the Between Two Ferns music. I can't believe we made it to Friday and no one made that joke yet. But I feel like Marlene would kill me if I asked mean, awkward questions of our guests, so it's probably for the best. It was a really great session, I really enjoyed it. It reminded me as a kid of playing that game SimCity where you'd build a wonderful city up with an electrical grid and roads and hospitals and houses and then all of a sudden Godzilla or a tornado would come through and kind of destroy the whole thing. And the session we're gonna have now is more on kind of the first part. How do you build the city of the future? And we have a, and what impact do renewables have in that? We have a wonderful group of panelists with us in order to walk through that. We have Lisa Brown, who's the Senior National Director of Municipal Infrastructure and Smart Cities at Johnson Controls. We have Susan Nicky, who's a Managing Director at Hannon Armstrong, and Benoit Thangen, who's the Founder and CEO of Renew Energy and a Deloitte alum. I'd like to welcome our panelists to the stage. So the format of our session is going to be similar to Dale's. We're going to take a couple minutes for each of our panelists to introduce themselves, give a little bit on their background and what their company does and what they do there. Then we're going to do about 25 or 30 minutes of moderated Q&A. We're going to talk about kind of the current role of renewables and real estate, opportunities, challenges, and also a little bit of financing and tax, hopefully at the end. We're going to try to leave 10 or 15 minutes for questions. So if you could enter them through the app as you have them, um, they'll show up up here as they have for prior sessions and then we'll work through those and try to get as many answered as possible. So to start off with, maybe Lisa, if you could give a little bit of background on yourself, and then we can sure. go through. Sure. Good morning, everyone. So I sit in the Performance Infrastructure and Advanced Solutions group of Johnson Controls for decades. We've been building smart buildings and doing energy efficiency and in the sustainability field for so long. So building renewables into the fabric of our overall holistic projects are definitely a priority for us and we help owners and building developers really pivot towards being more environmentally conscious as well as saving energy. I'm Susan Nicky, Managing Director from Hannon Armstrong. I lead our business development and client relationships in renewables. One of the things we'll talk about is how renewables are converging with energy efficiency and other technologies, which is exciting to see. Hannon Armstrong is publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange, and we focus on these kind of solutions to address carbon emissions and also resiliency, which uh, are now going hand in hand. Hi, my name is Benoit Thange, and I'm the CEO and founder of Renew Energy. We're a solar developer, and we're also a consulting firm. We focus on developing commercial, industrial, and utility-scale projects in the Northeast Mid-Atlantic. Uh, one of the high-profile projects that we're working on is actually the first project with the New York Housing Authority, where we're putting solar on 38 different buildings in Manhattan and Brooklyn. It's pretty innovative because it's with affordable housing. We're also doing it as a community solar project. We're providing solar to low-income housing housing, and we're also training NYCHA residents to install solar as well. So it's a pretty exciting and high-profile project, and look forward to continuing the conversation, Todd. Wonderful. 
So to start off with, it probably makes sense to talk a little bit about where we've been in the recent past and kind of where we are now. Susan, maybe you could start us off by talking about your perspective on the current role of renewables in real estate and how you've seen that change or grow over the past several years. Yeah, Hannon Armstrong has been investing uh, with our partner here, Johnson Controls, for many years in energy efficiency and in the last six years also on the renewable energy side. And what's interesting to see now is we hear often about, particularly I know a lot of the companies in this room know about how wind and solar have achieved increased, decreased their costs and improved their levelized cost of energy. That same trend has also happened on the energy efficiency side. LED light bulbs, have always, light bulbs have been a low hanging fruit, but the cost of the technologies behind in the energy efficiency are available for real estate. Perfect example, the elevators you, many, you've taken, up, taken here in this building, those kind of elevators save an amazing amount of energy. Little things. So as we see not only the technologies, but the automation, the software analytics allow us to do new things in the real estate market and integrate renewables, energy efficiency, different control systems, we really can start dealing with greening the real estate environment. Thank you. Benoit, could you give perspective on that question? Definitely. So we focus on the solar side, and the past five years has been really amazing with the cost decreases that you're seeing. I think it's decreased around 300 to 400%. Also, the efficiencies of the panels are getting better. Also, we're getting better at constructing the solar systems and being more efficient. So balance of system costs have gone down substantially. The cost of financing projects as well has gone down as well, and the returns that investors are seeking are lower. What we're seeing now is usually like the after-tax unlevered IR for a project is between 6 to 7%. It used to be double digits just five years ago. People are a lot more comfortable with financing solar. I actually used to work in project finance at Solar City Tesla, and I remember eight or nine years ago educating big banks about solar. And there, at that time, it was something really new, and it's exciting to kind of see how, as a technology, people have gotten very comfortable with it in a very short period of time. And also, I think you're going to mention this as well, Todd, is companies want, they have 100% renewable energy goals, so they're really focused on the top of their mind about it. So the conversations are a lot easier than, say, eight or nine years ago when you're already coming into the room and they're like, what's solar? I heard it's too expensive. Let's focus on other stuff. Yeah. So it's been mm -hmm. exciting to see within a five-year time frame how things have changed very quickly. Wonderful. Thank you. Lisa, maybe we can start off with you for our second question. How do you see renewable energy either on-site or off-site changing the real estate market in the future? Yeah, so that's a great question. The whole concept of urbanization, if you look at the United Nations or the World Institutes, Resource Institutes, stats, it's 70% of all humans, global citizens, will be living in urban cores. So uh, the majority of the money that municipalities and leaders have been spending has been following the wealth, and that's been in the suburbs for the last several decades. So the challenge is really how to create those environmentally conscious environments so that, and there's so much choice because it's such a virtual work environment now, um, not just millennials, but Zs. I think they talked about the purchasing power that they had yesterday. So they do, as Benoit said and Susan, they are demanding as part of a mandate when they move in as tenants that they need green, they need stewardship from the developers and from the owners, and they will pay higher rates, but at the same time, they will move to other places because they can. I'm sure we're all on planes all the time. I just sat next to someone who lives in San Antonio and works in Paris. So that's the worst nightmare for a municipal leader because they want you to live, work, and play in their particular patch of dirt, and that's the way they're going to thrive. And money is drying up, as we all know, from the federal government, and they need to do more with less, and so they're struggling. Susan, could you give your thoughts on that question? Yeah, I think as city, we've ch everything's changed from us just having to take power to our electricity and our power to being able to have choice. And we've seen the corporates and even cities and states demand that on the grid-connected side. But that's now migrating increasingly to the distributed side behind the meter. And even communities in uh, states like in California are establishing zero carbon, net zero communities as the developments of the future to attract the right corporates, the right tenants, and it can be done economically. So I think we're only going to see more of that trend. And what's important about that is when you look at the big cities, New York, 
Chicago. California is fairly green, but as those cities have signed up for the Paris Climate Accord, the only way that they can meet their goals is to either with the carrots and sticks or however to force their communities to decarbonize. Because 75% of the greenhouse gas emissions I recently heard, like in Chicago, comes from that built environment. So it's not only buying more power, which I happen to be from Chicago, Illinois, has enabled rooftop solar, community solar, but they're also trying to figure out ways to allow the buildings or incentivize the buildings to reduce their carbon footprint. Benoit, this is a question for you to start with. Sure. What's driving the interest in renewable energy? Sustainability, concern for climate change, cost savings, resiliency, all the above? I think it's really all the above. I think obviously companies are saying that they have 100% renewable energy goals. But when we're talking to the CFO or the energy manager, they're first focused on how it'll save money for them. And obviously from a marketing perspective, it's a huge opportunity. And what's exciting about at least I could talk on the solar side is that in a lot of markets, it's as competitive as fossil fuels. It's also localized energy as well. So I think it's a combination of everything. Everything, resiliency, priority for renewable energy, cost savings, and we're going to continue to see that as well. And I know during this two days, energy storage is also another huge thing. Solar and wind are an intermittent form of power, but once you're able to incorporate storage into that, that really changes everything where you're actually able to use that power when the sun's not shining. And so there's a lot of exciting things that are happening in the industry and changing very quickly. We're also seeing the same decreases in energy storage, specifically lithium-ion technology, price decreases. I know you have the person from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. He showed that chart, and it's just amazing to see how quickly batteries have gone down and will continue to go down. The other thing, too, is states are also passing incentives as well, state level, to couple solar plus storage, but then storage standalone for resiliency, ancillary services, and other things. So it's pretty exciting time right now. Lisa, have you seen similar drivers on the government municipal side? Absolutely. It is a combination, and they want to figure out, in many cases, it's all about deferred maintenance in municipalities, and they would love to talk about creating new revenue streams. And if they can, with taking that money and then diverting it in other places or working to, to use the data, and that's a big word. I don't know if there's been much yeah. conversation about that the last couple of days is how to take the data and how to package it and analyze it and potentially monetize it using using every sensor they have, using every technology that they've invested in, and they're struggling with it because many municipalities, they're not generally the first adopters. They want to know that someone else has done it first. But I was recently at a, an international conference and a uh, municipal leader in Nigeria came up and said that they were watching the work and had seen the um, floating solar array that we had done in the town of Walden in Colorado. So the world is watching what North America is doing. So developers and municipal leaders are really, while they might not want to be on the cutting edge, they need to be progressive in order to survive. Tweak on that question. Who's driving the interest? And Susan, maybe you could start off with this one. Is it tenants, landlords, investors, government, employees, all the above? Some well, mix? It's really, it is really all the above. But I think they're still the biggest driver in the last three, you know, whatever, three, four years, and now have been the corporates. I think there was a headline yesterday on corporates or exactly what it was, but they've really started doing the first, was first the high tech companies that executed PPAs for wind and solar. Now they're driving that down into their supply chains and working on ways to enable it on the renewable power side. But they're also looking at that in their buildings, again, about the only way they meet their goals of getting to 100% renewables and then to zero carbon is to figure out everything in their whole energy procurement side. So I think the corporates have been the big drivers, and then they forced the cities and the states to say, as Lisa said, gee, if I'm going to put my data center in your state, you better make sure you open up the market and force the utilities, which they did in some of the lagging states like Virginia or Michigan, Mm -hmm. to come up with models so that they could buy renewable power and then the utilities have jumped on board. So now as we see utilities saying, gee, the best way to keep my customers is to adopt renewables, figure out other ways to do, provide energy efficiency, different models in my territory, it becomes a win-win. So I think that momentum has been led by the bigger groups. So, and that actually just made me realize that I would say the majority of the discussions that we have municipal leaders, it used to be, how do I save energy? How do I recommission my building? Probably in the last 10 meetings I've been in, they've said, I need a microgrid. 
get, I need a microgrid, I need a partner. I don't even know if they realize what and how they're defining <laughs> a microgrid, but they have hearing that they need it and yeah. they want to be part of that and they want to be able to wrap that green brand around their cities because they're competing to be able to say, yes, we have a microgrid, yes, we have battery storage, yes, we're environmental stewards. So it's interesting how that's evolving. Definitely. Bunoy, could you speak to who or how maybe the project in the Northeast started? Who was the driver there? How did that come to you? Oh, so that was actually that specific project with the New York Housing Authority. We actually bid as a public RFP with NYCHA and then were awarded the projects in Manhattan and Brooklyn. And it's an interesting project because we're also trying to, with the lease payment, do some sort of roof restoration or improvement. A lot of times when we're talking to building owners, solar is a long-lived asset that's going to be there for 20 to 30 years. So you need a relatively new roof or roof in great condition. And that's usually a big challenge because because the building owner does not want to pay to fix the roof unless it's completely falling apart. They want to obviously delay the capital expenditure. So what we've been able to do actually in the Northeast markets is actually have a power purchase agreement where we include the roof restoration or a brand new roof with the solar through a power purchase agreement. I said, and you're probably asking, how does that happen? Well, one of the great things about the Northeast markets is that they have high cost of electricity, but they also have high state level incentives. Just to give you an example, because we're based in New Jersey, is the current solar renewable energy credit, which is an environmental commodity that we actually, as well, broker. We brokered about 28 million in those transactions and manage about 12 megawatts of projects. It's currently at 23 cents per kilowatt hour. The commercial customer basically pays between 10 to 13 cents. Mm. So that's a huge incentive. And then if you're not familiar as well with the incentives for solar, there's a 30% investment tax credit. There's accelerated depreciation, which effectively, it's five-year maker's depreciation, effectively represents 20% of the project cost. So 50% of the cost is in federal incentives. Then we have the state-level incentives. So it's very lucrative, and that's why we're able to then tie a roof into it as well. So it gets customers really excited. And since we're doing that project in Veter, which isn't if you don't know Veter, it's a value of distributed energy resources. It's basically the way of compensating for net metering. We're in Manhattan, Brooklyn. It's 28 cents per kilowatt hour. So obviously, it's a high electricity rate. So we're able to then incorporate some of these roof things. And if it's not coming out of pocket from the real estate owner, they're more excited to do the project and more financially motivated, especially if their roof is falling apart. It's a great financing mechanism. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lisa, this one's uh, for you to start with. What concerns pushback are you hearing from government agencies or companies considering investment in renewables? It sounds like it's a much easier conversation now than it maybe would have been five years ago, but what pushback are you getting and how do you kind of overcome that? Right. So when we talk about, we're launching a new initiative, a program, Secure Connected Resilient Communities, because we think that it's really important for them to make sure that their buildings, however we define, Smart Cities has one of those 50 definitions, resiliency has similar, but we think renewable is a big part of that fabric. They think the ROI isn't there. That's generally, we just did another global research report regarding what are the barriers, what's motivating folks, and over 20 countries and about 2,000 leaders, they said it was that lack of ROI. They're saying that they have lack of technical expertise to be able to validate the work that we're all bringing to them and then the strategies and suggestions, and often they don't want to be first. So it's to kind of lull them. I've been called a municipal psychiatrist <laughs> because I come in sometimes and I talk to them and they have wonderful ideas, but sometimes they're in positions where they have to worry about all the other silos and all the other decision makers. So we let them know that it's good, it's important wherever they are on their path towards being renewable and or off the grid or more resilient. And we just try to encourage them, but it's that they still say that the ROI is still unproven. I might think. disagree. <laughs> <laughs> no, I totally agree. And it's interesting because we hear the same thing. Hey, can you incorporate energy storage? Can you yeah. incorporate a microgrid? I thought it too, an interesting thing that Susan and I talked before, which you guys mentioned as well, is the software platform to be able to take all these different energy technologies and storage. And how do you monetize that through resiliency, answer services I talked about, demand reduction, is a lot of 
complicated questions that we're getting. We're, even though we're a solar developer, we're trying to come with a whole holistic solution. First focus on LEDs, energy efficiency, then look at renewable energy, storage. Everyone wants to get off the grid as much as possible for resilience. So it's interesting because there's now all these different software providers out there that are saying that you could monetize these different distributed assets and storage. And we're trying to still understand that aspect of it. Yeah. It's a sticky subject because so many, and I'm just talking from the city side, there's so many technology companies and utilities that are coming to municipal leaders saying, I want to buy that data. I want to own it in perpetuity. I want to do so. And so they realize that, and there's all the privacy concerns and their needs to stand up for what's best for their citizens and their businesses. So they're struggling with the thought of how to analyze the data, how to gather it, how to package it, productize it, and potentially monetize it. But the conversation is if they're not going to monetize it, someone else is going to. So, And they're looking to the renewables as well to say, this is such a rich data set that I have. What can I do in order to create new revenue streams, to be able to invest in new technologies and make more people come to my city? So it's coming. It's still a little sensitive, but the data's out there. I think there's more, what is it, about 50 billion devices attached to the cloud right now, which is more than we have human beings. So all those devices are emitting data, and we need to figure out how to harness it. It's all new models. I think some of the regulators and public policy administrators are figuring out it's difficult. It's easy to say 100% renewable energy or 75%, but as we increase that target, how we get there economically is still, I think, the balance. And when you look at the real estate environment, New York is leading the charge with New York City with also putting targets or requirements on buildings to reduce their carbon footprint. And that has caused, obviously, a lot of discussions among the building owners about, oh, it's great, you just said we had to reduce our carbon footprint in our building by X percent by a certain date, but how are we really going to do that? How are we going to get all the trucks out? How are we going to get this deployed? So I think the rate, a lot of the, the public policy administrators are trying to figure out how to do this, but then work with business leaders in the community to get something that's realistic and practical. Benoit, maybe we'll start with you on this one. In your view, where do the most significant opportunities exist in real estate for renewables? Battery storage, maybe community solar might be sure. a topic to discuss here. Yeah, I think when we approach real estate companies or potential companies, it's a lot easier when the owner of the building actually pays the energy bill because if they're not paying the energy bill, then the landlord's not as focused on energy savings. So we try to focus on people who actually, what's been the challenge is like you have REITs who own the building for maybe eight to 12 years. And then if you try to convince them to go solar, it's been challenging because let's say if there's a power purchase agreement, then the new buyer of that has to take on that, which makes it more challenging to sell the building. So a lot of times, building owners who are leasing out their space, it's a lot more challenging. But what we're seeing it's changed is tenants are actually putting pressure on where they're looking at. And as far as they want it to be in a location that's renewable, that's green. And obviously, we talked about this before, there's a huge opportunity with community solar. I don't know how familiar or if that's really been discussed. Community solar is basically certain states that pass legislation where you could buy energy from a community solar project that's within the utility service area. And why is it, it's attracted to developers is you could have a utility scale project and then instead of getting wholesale rates at the grid, like for example, in New Jersey, it's between two to four and a half cents per kilowatt hour. You could charge residential customers in that load zone or even businesses, and they pay between 12 to 18 cents. And then it's a discount to that. So there's a huge opportunity. I think SIA, which is the national lobbying group for solar, is saying that the projection for the next five years is 5.5 gigawatts of community solar in the U.S. And each program is unique. So why, for real estate owners, it's really attractive. You could basically, there are developers who are, will lease your roof out, and then you have no real responsibility for the solar. And they're really attracted to that with just with getting a lease payment for basically an asset that they're not really using. And it's really enticing for them in community solar because you could effectively do a roof lease, which you could do if you did on-site and do a discounted PPA arrangement. But community solar as well provides like real estate owners an opportunity to make certain income from land or even the rooftop that they're not using currently. Yeah, we're seeing the same. We're Hannah Armstrong's financing community solar, but it's a great solution. There's only so many rooftops that 
that really support rooftop solar, but it enables not only economic deployment, but choice. And again, some of the, the cities are rolling out the, that legislation to make sure that the community solar projects have some residential and multi-tenant buildings and not just a few big corporates that benefit from that. So there's that mix of public policy to uh, open up, up the market to everyone. Hi, this is Benoit, your host of the Solar Maverick Podcast. I would like to thank Schwerd Consulting for being the sponsor for this episode. Schwerd Consulting is a leading solar consulting firm dedicated to design, engineering, and owner's representation in all areas of solar photics for the commercial, industrial, and utility markets. At Schwerd Consulting, they like to say, we know solar, we don't just do solar. What sets them apart is their 100% focus on solar and understanding the business of their clients. In its five years of business, Schwerd Consulting has provided services for approximately 450 megawatts of PV across over 330 sites and 15 states plus the Caribbean. That total includes 300 megawatts of completed designs and engineering and 150 megawatts of consulting and owner rep services. Let Schwerd Consulting take the burden off you and bring ease and expertise in all areas of engineering and design or help you navigate the technical world of solar. If you're interested in learning more about Schwerd Consulting, you can call at 215-219-6718 or email at admin at schwerdconsulting.com. Schwerd Consulting website is www.schwerdconsulting.com. We'll also have this information as well in the notes of the podcast. Steve Schwerd, who's the owner of Schwerd Consulting, was interviewed on episode 17 and 48 of the Solar Maverick podcast and also episode 42, which was a panel discussion on how solar technology is changing the world. Thank you to Schwerd Consulting for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Lisa, maybe you could provide some thoughts on where the opportunities exist on the smart city government side. Yeah, it's so interesting you talk about the community solar and just the whole concept. Smart Cities has been around for probably eight or nine years, and it really started as technology investments pushed down from government to the community. It shifted more, just for the lack of ROI, as we mentioned before, to more of an outcome-based solution. And now we're in like a Smart Cities 3.0, which really is the citizen and nonprofit's voice is as loud hopefully, and and as potent as the government's voice. And we find so much interesting and intriguing opportunities that the actual communities are bringing. And from a government standpoint, they're still trying to figure out how to be able to do less with more in terms of not having all that funding and trying to keep people in place. There is, I was just at a BOMA uh, conference not too long ago where they were saying that it was in Canada and they were mentioning that tenants were paying extreme premium for what they considered green buildings. My son just moved into a LEED certified fraternity house, which wow. I thought was very interesting. <laughs> not sure how that's all going to work out as the months go by, but um, there is a rumba floating around. There are Dyson, but and they paid, the national chapter paid more for that fraternity and for them to live there. So I think governments, again, know that in order, they're competing globally, and it's not just with their cities and the counties nearby, but they're competing with cities that they never thought. And if they're not creating that environmental green wrapper around their brand, they're getting older, poorer, and and drying up. I think there was something on Smart Cities Week this morning that if cities are not embracing resiliency, they are bleeding to the following counties and cities. So they know there's a mandate. They're looking for folks like you to give them vision and assistance, and they all want to get on that journey. It's just they don't know how. And often the smaller cities and counties don't have technology directors. They don't have sustainability directors. The mayor might have been a small business owner prior or the city manager. So they're looking for advisors such as yourselves to come in and partner with them because they're concerned that they're going to fail. And that's their administrative cycle. And they want to be able to get back into office. Thank you. We're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about maybe the financing side. So, Susan, maybe we'll start off with you on this one. What trends are you seeing in financing renewables in real estate? I know in my own practice, I'm hearing from REITs and infrastructure funds, new sources of capital that we typically haven't seen in the market. What are you all seeing? Part of the challenge sometimes in the real estate market is the projects are smaller. It's easier to write a check for $100 million or more for a utility-scale project, and it's to distributed solar markets, attracted funds. I think what's going to be a challenge, but the capital's there, is coming up with the financing models and the scale 
by getting standardized contracts like we have in, in the renewable market so capital can come in. We are we're familiar with power purchase agreements, which have been around for a long time and easy to finance now. On the energy efficiency side, we've done contracts at Hannon for years with Johnson Controls and others for energy efficiency, which were financed through the savings. What we're seeing the trend is now is the energy providers like you are coming into your corporates and they want savings, they want renewable power, they want demand-side management, storage can get paid for through some of these things, is taking a bundled offering and really migrating those two historical successful contract models into energy as a service, energy management as a service. We're going to see EV charging as a service, E as a service, depending on what solution the customer or client wants. I think is going to be the future of how do we bring, then the capital can follow. So we get some standardized and some financeable models. And we had a press release yesterday where Hannon's financing a software technology company that's doing energy management as a service and lots of smaller retail sites for bigger companies. But that they're doing it in a way that automates and lets them get savings in their buildings through the automation controls that are being put in. So we see that as starting to break through and really exciting as the next wave. As long as it cash flows. <laughs> as long as it cash flows. Oh, it has to, yeah. Obviously, it has to have to. You have to have the cash flows. We're all about the cash flows. So <laughs> Benoit, could you give thoughts on financing models you're seeing? Yeah, uh, definitely. So I think one of the big things that I mentioned before is that the returns for these projects are getting lower, and it's because a lot of new capital is coming into the space. So we're seeing a lot of international players, pension funds, insurance companies who have lower return requirements. And what's happening is that Before it used to be, there used to be a lot of good projects and not a lot of investors. Now there's so much investment dollars for very little projects. So right now, I mean, there's premium sort of fees for developers. And it's just amazing how many players are out there. I think the other thing, too, is we mentioned about the power purchase agreement. Obviously, financiers, like the longer the tenor, the better. It was normally accepted for 20 to 15 years as far as a power purchase agreement. But we're seeing where financiers are getting comfortable with shorter tenures of contract. Usually, like an off-site corporate PPA is between 8 to 10 years. With community solar as well, we're, like, for example, this NYCHA project, we're actually doing the offtake where it's 100% residential and there's no long-term agreement. And we've gotten financiers comfortable with that, where they're comfortable with taking merchant risk. These type of investors are energy companies and they have sophisticated trading desks, so they're very comfortable with taking merchant risk. And we think you're going to see more of that, where there's going to be more of a merchant tail when it comes to financing, less sort of contracted cash flow. And those are kind of the two major trends that we're seeing in the market. Mm -hmm. One last question before we kind of jump to the audience, and that's what role do federal, state, local tax incentives play in getting these technologies to market? And are there any programs that you're particularly excited about? Maybe, Lisa, if you could start off with this one. Yeah, it goes back to what we were just saying. At Johnson Controls, we generally start with audits and cash flows to be able to figure out how we can create a larger, more holistic scope of work for our our partners and our customers. But renewables were challenged with having them cash flow over the years. But now with those incentives and those rebates, grants, they do nicely. And within a 20-year period, so we can get someone like Hannah Armstrong to work with us from a financing standpoint. But they make all the difference. I think on the federal side, what's exciting is we're really seeing momentum on putting a price on carbon as the next thing, as tax incentives have worked for the purpose of the mature technologies, but a price on carbon would really open up the markets and levelize the playing field, not only in renewable energy, but transportation in the built environment. So I think we're all watching the 2020 campaign and some of the bills that are being introduced. That'll be exciting to see how that hopefully plays out in the coming years. But for new things like storage it's and technologies that really still need some incentives and also a revenue model to get deployed, it's helpful in California, the Northeast, other places where they're trying to get storage going and build in resiliency and, and sort of test out some of these new revenue streams to have the incentives that help pay for the initial costs. So whoever the sponsors here can get the projects deployed and financiers, we're not a tax credit investor, but along with tax equity investors can to get some of these newer things going. 
For us, I mean, I think it's the same thing. We're hearing potentially there is obviously some legislation about having standalone storage being qualified mm. for the investment tax credit. That would be a huge opportunity to qualify as when it's combined with storage and using all the energy from that. Also, I know we mentioned this before is a lot of real estate developers are developing in opportunity zones. If you're not familiar, if you develop in an opportunity zone, you could defer capital gains if it's within in the investment for 10 years. So they're asking as well, can we couple in solar or other renewable energy or energy upgrades to that? Actually, this project that we're developing with the New York Housing Authority is all in opportunity zone. So we are talking opportunity zone investors as well. And we think it potentially could be a big opportunity, but we're still trying to figure it out. I think it's still very early in the process. The IRS came out with more detail in May. I know in one of the plenary sessions, they talked about opportunity zone and Deloitte could talk about it a lot better than I can in detail. So yeah, definitely a powerful program. Actually, I lied. One more question before we hop to sure. the audience. We've talked a lot about kind of the U.S. market. Lisa, you had mentioned some discussions with folks overseas. Are there lessons to be learned from what we're seeing overseas? Or are they kind of looking to the U.S.? What does this look like internationally? I think it's both. I think Scandinavia is, is light years ahead of us in terms of the way they handle water efficiencies as they handle resiliency. Australia seems to be ahead of us. But they do look to North America for innovation. I know when we've done our research in terms of what the next steps are and, and what the, ba- the barriers are. And, and I think it was from a 77% of our audience said that there was going to be an increased investment in renewable energy, energy efficiency across the globe. I think that when I looked at those numbers, I think it was like Germany and Switzerland and a few other areas were probably a little bit ahead of us, but the United States and Canada were pretty close there. They do look to us to kind of attempt to do some new things from floating soda battery storage. We just signed a joint venture with Capital Dynamics for battery storage offering that we can bring to our customers a great value. And so we're definitely looking at that. But the challenge is that we're 50 states. And so often when they look to us as, well, why can't you put some large federal or legislation in place, et cetera, there isn't. And so we're almost like 50 countries. And getting it down to where I work in the municipal level, there's states and then there's municipalities and then they all have different regulations. They all have different legislation that they adhere to. It's very difficult for North America, at least for the states, to be able to do sweeping innovation across the entire United States because we all adhere to different rules and different forms of government. And that was the biggest challenge I had when I came into this role about six years ago was just the myriad of governmental organizational structures and just the decision making and everything's involved. So while we do want to be advanced thinkers and progressive in the United States, I think that there's a lot to learn from Asia and from our friends in Scandinavia. Well, it's a real trend that we've seen is the European energy companies, what they've seen in their own backyard, and they've converted to sell their fossil fuel thermal and get aggressively into renewables, but also to drive and say, gee, it's, we need to be customer centric. So they've already are transforming their utilities to the future, which is distributed, digitalized, decarbonized as NG would say, but you look at then NG, NL, they all had old names before, EDF, they've aggressively come into the U.S. market then because we have the scale, a lot of technology, software innovators that they're not only big on the renewable power grid connected side, but they've aggressively bought up automation companies, software platform storage companies to be able to go into their clients, their big clients particularly, and say, we can help you with your energy as a service, we can help you with your GHG goals, and they're thinking about it more holistically. So I think that's where we've seen Europe come to the U.S., but the U.S. provides really the base for them to roll that strategy out and then go around the world. And now you see Shell is another company, which is really European-based, and now our own utilities and some of the renewable energy companies here think about it increasingly the same way. Question from the audience. California has mandated solar on new builds. Do you guys see that spreading to other states, localities, other areas? Definitely. So it's interesting because I've been hearing in New York, they've been talking about that. In New Jersey, it hasn't obviously passed, but I think California has always been the front runner when it comes to renewables and energy and storage. So I, you know, a lot of the other states, and I know this was mentioned in the prior panel, basically look at what other states are doing to reach their 
their goals and try to make it a better system or they think it's a better way of doing it. So I think it's going to be the trend in the future. And I think for California, that's only residential. That's not commercial industrial. So how can revised building codes spur renewable energy investment? Is there a model solar building code similar to the model energy efficiency code? I think that in the building codes, like in Chicago and New York, it's not so much mandating exactly what you have to do, but that you need to get there Mm -hmm. in terms of decarbonizing or reducing your carbon emissions in your buildings or what are the codes you need. In new building, it's easier with new buildings to say, okay, the code is going to be you have to have a green roof, you have to have X, Y, Z, you have to facilitate having the building having renewable energy. Oftentimes, solar on a rooftop is not going to work in downtown Chicago or or Manhattan, even on new buildings or old buildings. But I think it's more trying to figure out what codes are doable and then opening up options and choice for the building tenants. Is that... You're more I, the expert than I am, though. No, I would agree. It's retrofit for the most yeah. part in North America. When we're building from scratch, we're actually building a smart city or a smart village in Canton at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So it's wonderful because we can start a thing from scratch. And we look at buildings as adaptive shells, that if you think about how they have to be flexible and nimble for the users and you keep that end user in mind when you're building, it's very different than when you're retrofitting. And there's so many limitations to that. Another question from the audience, what's the scope for electrifying heat in buildings so it can be sourced from renewables? You guys seen or thought about that yet? Pass. Pass. (laughs) (laughs) Another question, what are your thoughts on the ITC for energy property being extended and how important that is to financing renewables? There's never been more capital available to finance renewables and that increases every day. So let's talk about when you look at capital trends, just as we were talking about customers want to decarbonize. So when I'm talking about capital, I think that it's helpful to have tax credits as we have new technologies. But if we want to open up the markets and really bring in all the capital that's available from pension funds and other institutional investors who are looking to put their capital to work and decarbonize and de-risk their own portfolios, the more we simplify our funding structures that facilitate that, the faster we'll get more of that capital in. Wonderful. And then probably time for one more from the audience. What's the likelihood of our regulatory authorities actually implementing a carbon tax? Does anyone have a crystal ball? Vinoy, crystal ball? I mean, I think it's not going to happen with our current president. He's not going to put a carbon tax. I know the Obama administration, they were talking about potentially doing that. I think this goes back to not having national energy policy, which has hurt a lot of development of renewable energy. It's interesting because we've done stuff internationally, and it all starts at the national level. (laughs) And when I talk to foreign investors coming to the U.S. markets, they're confused because they think community solar is the same in Minnesota, New York, Massachusetts. Massachusetts, and they find out the rules are totally different. So I think that's probably not going to happen for a very, the probability I think is slim to none that a carbon tax will actually ever be, you know. I agree. I think there's car- there'll be carbon mandates at the municipal level. You're right. It's the upside down. It's right? the upside down. Where we are. And when we go, I'm just about to go to the ICMA, which is the International City Manager Association, National League of Cities. They talk about how all the real work is being done at the local level. And that's true. So it'd be, if you have lack of federal funding or a, a non-believers, it needs to happen at a level. I know that I saw something about crowdsourcing, but it needs to start at that grassroots level. And it's not as grassroots. It's municipal leaders making municipal decisions, and they can put mandates on new buildings or new new tenants or small businesses moving into their footprint. So I don't know if I'd go as far as a tax, but I do think there'll be strong suggestions. I'll be a little more positive that I believe that we are where we are in our current administration, but if you see that increasingly... Everyone in this room, the majority of the voters, I see that climate is the biggest issue of our time. It's something that needs to be addressed. While we've had all the challenges in federal policy, both the Republicans and Democrats are increasingly looking for whether it's a carbon tax and dividend or carbon pricing, something that replaces the current regimes in 2021, 2022, and that corporates and others are saying, we do, we're already embedding a price on carbon. How do we come up with something that'll fit both our national situation as well as still having uh, decentralized states that control the energy environment. So I think it's really an important thing that, to keep paying attention to and watching the Climate Leadership Council, which is really all the leading economists and Republicans advocating what people have said is unheard of before, and to listen to the drum continue to grow and play a part in it. Wonderful. Well, that's the last question we had time for today, so we perfect on time. I want to thank our panelists for their time. 
human perspective. I know I really enjoyed the conversation. So thank you guys for joining. Thank you all. Thanks for listening to the Solar Maverick Podcast. The Solar Maverick Podcast is brought to you by Renew Energy. We're a solar development and consulting firm. If you believe that this podcast is adding value to you, please give us a five-star review and share with those that you think could benefit from this information. Please email all questions, suggestions, and feedback to info at renewenergy.com. That's I-N-F-O at R-E-N-E-U-Energy.com. The Solar Maverick Podcast is produced by Podcast Laundry and executive produced by Benoit Thangin and Kevin Y. Brown. 